This is Land of Havilah, Leviticus 25a. We know about the weekly Sabbath day, but Yahweh commanded that there should also be a Sabbath year every seventh year. Verse 1. Yahweh said to Moses in Mount Sinai, Speak to the children of Israel, and tell them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to Yahweh. You shall sow your field six years, and you shall prune your vineyard six years, and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to Yahweh. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. What grows of itself in your harvest you shall not reap, and you shall not gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall be for food for you, for yourself, for your servant, for your maid, for your hired servant, and for your stranger who lives as a foreigner with you, for your livestock also, and for the animals that are in your land, shall all its increase be for food. Comment. Yahweh introduced the Sabbath year in Exodus 23:10 to 11, saying that every seventh year Israelites should let the land lie fallow. Of course, when Yahweh said this, Israel was at Mount Sinai and had no crops, so the law didn't apply quite yet. He said previously in Exodus that in the Sabbath year there shall be no plowing, sowing, pruning, or harvesting, including of their staple crops, which was mostly grain, grapes, and olives. They'll be eating from their stores that year, Leviticus 25, 21. The grapes and olive groves will still produce without being touched, and even in the grain fields, some grain will grow of itself, but everything's to be left for the poor and for animals, Exodus 23, 11. In verse 6, we just read, there's nothing wrong with the owner of the field enjoying some himself, but he needs to keep in mind that whatever grows on his property is for all practical purposes without any owner, any one of the public's free to come on his property and gather whatever, so the owner can't count on any food for himself from his property, and if he's upright, he'll leave as much as he can for the poor. The word Sabbath comes from a Hebrew word that means rest. Every type of Sabbath in the Bible has rest in common, whether it's the weekly Sabbath day, or the annual high Sabbath, such as the Day of Atonement, or the Sabbath year. In verse 5, Yahweh said the Sabbath year would be a year of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath of the land. But of course, since Yahweh forbids most agricultural work that year, it'll be somewhat of a rest for the people too, for the farmers. Later in Deuteronomy 15, Yahweh will add that all debts should be canceled that year, except debts owed by foreigners. Thus the year became known as the Shemitah in Hebrew. Shemitah means release. Every Israelite shall be released from his debts. So release of debts put debtors at rest that year. In Deuteronomy 31.10, coming, which is coming up later, Yahweh added one more command concerning this year, that when all Israel was gathered that year at the Feast of Tabernacles, quote, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing, end quote probably meaning the book of Deuteronomy, which is a summary of all the law. The audience shall include men, women, little ones, and foreigners living among them. Everyone should hear the law. Yahweh knows already that Israel is going to ignore him at times, even ignore him altogether for long periods of time, Deuteronomy 31:16. By the time of the Babylonian captivity, Israel had ignored him for many years regarding the Sabbath of the land. Thus Yahweh said he would expel them from the land for 70 years so that the land would have 70 Sabbaths straight to make up for the Sabbaths of the land they didn't observe, 2 Chronicles 36, 21. Now moving on, Yahweh will introduce the year of Jubilee, which will be every 50th year. Yahweh's rationale for the year of Jubilee is that he'll be giving every family an inheritance in the promised land, meaning land, every family will get land. But knowing the nature of men, Yahweh knows some individuals will be very poor at retaining ownership of their land. They'll sell it for money, blow the money, and be poor. They might have to sell themselves into servitude, from which they should be released every seven years, as we just said, but that won't get them their land back. However, they will get their land back every 50 years on the year of Jubilee, if they're still living, or if they've already passed away, their posterity will get it back 
as we'll see coming up. Verse 8, You shall count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, and there shall be to you the days of seven Sabbaths of years, even forty-nine years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. You shall make the fiftieth year holy and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee to you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall not sow, neither reap that which grows of itself, nor gather from the undressed vines. For it's a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat of its increase out of the field. In this year of jubilee each of you shall return to his property. Comment in verse 9, The year of jubilee begins on the day of atonement every fiftieth year at the sound of the shofar in Hebrew, shofar meaning ram's horn. The sound shofars throughout the land proclaiming the arrival of the year of jubilee. In verse 10, everyone gets his ancestral land back, which means families that have been separated over the years will be reunited on the land, assuming they wish to move back to their family's land. But even if they don't move back, they'll get some ownership of it. Families will remain connected for centuries if Israel releases the land at Jubilee as they should. Thus, in the future of the Promised Land, many of the locales will be known by the names of the families that settled there. The same is true in modern America that there are towns called Smithville, for example, but typically we'd be hard-pressed to find any of the original family living there. But not so in ancient Israel. People in various locales will have a sense of being distantly related because of the law of Jubilee. They keep coming back to the land every 50th year. In verses 11 and 12, the year of Jubilee shall be an extra Sabbath of the land. In other words, there'll be two Sabbaths of the land in a row every 50 years, two years in a row. What will they eat? Yahweh will address that shortly. Jubilee will affect land values because every buyer will know he'll have to give the land back to the original family on Jubilee. Thus, at the time of sale, the closer it is to Jubilee, the less the buyer will be willing to pay for it. If he, no, if he can only keep it for a short time, it won't be worth that much to him. Therefore, Yahweh says, verse 14, If you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. According to the number of years of the crops, he shall sell to you. According to the length of the years, you shall increase its price, and according to the shortness of the years, you shall diminish its price, for he's selling the number of crops to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am Yahweh your God. Comment in verses 14 to 17, you shall adjust the price of the land according to how many years of crops are left on it. Coming up, if Israel will obey Yahweh's laws about land ownership, plus observe his other statutes, he'll make them safe and prosperous. Verse 18, therefore you shall do my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and you shall dwell in the land safely. The land shall yield its fruit and you shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. Comment. When an Israelite hears about being prosperous, as Yahweh just said, he'll naturally assume he won't be very prosperous every seventh year when he can't farm, and especially the two years in a row that he can't farm. Coming up, Yahweh anticipated this reaction. Verse 20, If you said, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow, nor, nor gather in our increase. Then I'll command my blessing on you in the sixth year, and it shall bear fruit for three years. You shall sow the eighth year and eat of the fruits, the old store, until the ninth year, until its fruits come in, you shall eat the old store. Comment in verses 21 and 22, even when Jubilee rolls around and there's no farming for two years straight, it'll be no problem. In the final year of agriculture, before the two years of no agriculture, Yahweh will make the land super productive. It'll produce enough to put in storage to last three years. Verse 23, The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and live as foreigners with me. In all the land of your possession you shall grant a redemption for the land. 
comment Yahweh says, you shall grant a redemption of the land. What's he talking about? Verse 25. If your brother becomes poor and sells some of his possessions, then his kinsman who's next to him shall come and redeem that which his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, and he becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, then let him reckon the years since its sale and restore the surplus to the man to whom he sold it, and he shall return to his property. But if he isn't able to get it back for himself, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of him who's bought it until the year of Jubilee, and in the Jubilee it shall be released, and he shall return to his property. Comment in verses 25 to 28, redemption of the land works like this. If a man living on his ancestral property becomes poor and has to sell his land, of course there'll be a new owner. If one of the poor man's relatives comes along with the money to purchase the land, the owner of it should grant the sale of it to the, back, to the, back to the family. This is redemption of the land. The relative has redeemed the land back into the family. Hopefully he'll let his poor relative benefit from the land sum. In verses 26 to 27, if the poor man gets back on his feet and wants to repurchase his land, the owner should grant the sale. In verse 28, if no one redeems the land, still the land will revert to the family at Jubilee. Coming up, the law is different for urban land. Verse 29, if a man sells a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it's been sold. For a full year he shall have the right of redemption. If it isn't redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that's in the walled city shall be made sure in perpetuity to him who bought it. Throughout his generations, it shall not be released in the, in the Jubilee. But the houses of the villages which have no wall around them shall be accounted for with the fields of the country. They shall be redeemed, and they shall be released in the Jubilee. Comment in verses 29 to 31, property in a walled city must be redeemed within one year of the time of sale. After that, there is nothing forcing the owner to sell it back to the family ever. It shall become the permanent property of the buyer. Furthermore, Jubilee will have no effect on it. The family's lost it, period, unless they purchase it on the open market. Coming up, the tribe of Levi will inherit 48 cities scattered all over Israel, including some attached pasture lands. The laws of ownership in the Levites' urban areas are the same as for agricultural land, which is that it's always subject to redemption and subject to release at Jubilee. This gives the Levites a lot of land security within their families. Furthermore, the Levites' pasture lands around those cities shall never be subject to sale. Verse 32, Nevertheless, the cities of the Levites, the houses in the cities of their possession, the Levites may redeem at any time. The Levites may redeem the house that was sold and the city of his possession, and it shall be released in the Jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the field of the pasture lands of their cities may not be sold, for it's their perpetual possession. Comment. The Christian life's like one giant Sabbath and Jubilee all the time, but we won't come into the fullness of it until the hereafter. God releases us from whatever we owe Him. He redeems us. He commands us to rest from our works. We don't have to work for our salvation. He promises to give us a possession in the hereafter where we'll be united with our extended Christian family. And as Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, we'll have a permanent possession that no one can take from us. None of these analogies are by accident. Yahweh commanded all this for our instruction. Romans 15.4 Leviticus 25b is next at landofhavilah.net